All right, everybody, we are live. All right, hello everyone. And thank you for joining us this Monday for our product education Zoom or health topic education Zoom. What we're gonna discuss today is something I actually get quite a few questions on. And I would love, especially Ryan, to go into big detail and explain really what it's all about and kind of, I guess I don't wanna say debunk some of it, but tell the truth to it all. So we're going to talk about bioavailability and if you or absorption rate of, of uh, nutrients uh, supplements. If you've ever heard the term bioavailability, you will see it sometimes on a lot of supplements, and that's what we want to discuss. But really, in layman's terms, bioavailability is how well your body absorbs and uses a supplement when it enters the body. Now, when you think about that, there's got to be lots of variability to that because everybody's so unique and why one body might be able to absorb more vitamins and nutrients from something, another body can't, whether it's disease states, whether it's um, microbiome disturbances, leaky gut, all kinds of factors affect how well our body actually absorbs a nutrient. So when you see this claim or this label about 95% bioavailability, you have to think to yourself, what's the truth into that? And what's really the science behind it? And that's where this guy over here is gonna take over. Oh, my turn over. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about this. So bioavailability is the rate and extent to which a, in a drug or a chemical uh, molecule reaches a site of action. So it's desired site of action. And traditionally speaking, it has a lot to do with absorption, but it really does have a lot to do with like the whole range of pharmacokinetics is the kind of the term that they've coined for it, where it's absorption, well, really, it starts with like dissolution, like how is the drug dissolving if it's in a solid state, like a tablet it dissolves, right, then absorbs, then it has to distribute out through our bodies, then it's metabolized either by the liver or other system, and then it's excreted or eliminated from the body. So that whole kind of thing is the pharmacokinetics, and that is sort of really the bioavailability. It's kind of what makes up bioavailability. Again, coined from pharmaceuticals because... The pharmaceutical industry has to prove bioavailability. So it is a real term. I know it's super confusing. I know it's thrown around a lot. There's a lot of misunderstanding around it, but it really is kind of founded in the pharmaceutical side. And remember, the FDA regulates pharmaceutical drugs. They make sure, well, they regulate dietary supplements too, but they make sure they have to prove bioavailability, a new drug application or a supplement or an investigative new drug. They have to provide prove it. Um, with some exceptions, of course. So in the world of dietary supplements, we have certainly borrowed from some of the pharmaceutical process to show bioavailability. Um, and that's some of the stuff we'll talk a little bit about today. But I want you guys to remember bioavailability applies virtually to everything we put in our body. I mean, or, or on our body. It uh, could apply to our foods. So like plants, right? Meats. You know, if you eat a plant and you hear things like, oh, it has anti-nutrients, things that block or uh, kind of suppress some of the bioavailability. There are, um, so again, it's a whole thing, right? Like, and we'll go through that a little bit today. At least we'll kind of talk a little bit about, I'll sort of go into the weeds. I try to keep it under 15 minutes, but go into the weeds about it. But at the end of the day, I mean, I do think that it, it, for people that are consuming dietary supplements or there are supplements to food, we are regulated under the FDA, but we are not required to prove bioavailability. Okay. So does that mean that some of these supplements that slap on the label with a little asterisk, of course, you know, 95% bioavailability, like, does that have relevance to it? Uh, if, if they're not testing like pharmaceuticals are? I, I, I mean, look, could, could I say I'm guilty in some regard? I'm going to say I hate when I see that, but I'm also guilty at the same time. I'm going to tell you that we use a highly bioavailable form of magnesium. But I'm just borrowing on the literature that the big pharmaceutical companies have already shown us. But some companies, and I know there's one here as an example, we're going to show that. It bothers me because I know it's just a marketing ploy. There's no science behind it. They haven't paid to have studies done in vivo, which is in the body. Some companies, so some, here, here's a little bit of background. So some companies that are dietary supplement companies that have a solid dosage form, like a tablet, they may want to pay a little bit of extra money and show the dissolution studies to show that the tablet does break down into the, in the stomach when it goes down in there, because that is an important first step. 
but most do not. Like in our case, we have powders, we have capsules, we have a soft gel. You don't have to. They're, it's, they're going to dissolve, no, no doubt about it. We don't have to do dissolution studies. Um, but nobody's going to be doing bioavailability studies for the most part in dietary supplements, for the most part. Okay. Some of the ingredients, some of the ingredient companies might be, but let's use this as an example, Lisa. I want to show this. I think this is important. All right, here we go. What do we have here, Lisa? That's a liposomal glutathione. So can you see liposomal glutathione? I'm not even sure who it's made by, but Lisa has it here. Seems like, I guess she's been using it or whatever. Glutathione is a, a great antioxidant, historically terrible bioavailability. I would love to have glutathione in our lineup, but I'm not convinced that I can get you guys what you deserve for the money you're going to pay for it. So on this label, it says liposomal. Well, first of all, they, they chose liposomal because it's a way to increase bioavailability, but... I don't think it's working in this case. And then right here on the side, it says highly bioavailable, but highly bioavailable based on what? Right. Based on what? That's, that's where you see it as just a little bit of a it, marketing term. And it, then it just puts an asterisk on it and says, these have not been evaluated by the FDA. You know, again, just showing you yeah. like, they're just putting something on there that sounds great. Um, and helps their marketing. Just another great example though. You see how it's in liquid. It's an aqueous form. There's water. So it tells you better consume within 30 days of opening because of stability reasons. So there's bacterial contamination that can occur. Obviously, the active ingredients start to degrade rather rapidly. I, I'm not a fan of that product whatsoever. Right. I hold, that, much... hold that specifically because it has on there the highly bioavailable. Right. Right. All right. So let's talk about routes of administration. Right. So when you talk about bioavailability, it has to do mostly with absorption. But everything else we just talked about, absorption. So how do we improve absorption? Like, what do we do there? Number one, everything has to go into a solution to be absorbed, and it starts in the stomach. But right, so powders, capsules, soft gels, it will all get into the stomach. Well, actually, the powders we're mixing in water, so it's going into solution even before we get it to our stomach. But it gets down in there, mixes in the stomach, in the sludge, it dissolves, it comes out. And depending on other characteristics, where is it going to start absorbing? Some, some, some things will absorb in the stomach right then and there. Other things, most drugs, most pharmaceuticals, most dietary supplements have to pass into the small intestine where the pH is a little higher. Because in the stomach, the pH is very, very acidic. It's around like one or two. But by the time it gets into the small intestine, it's more closer to neutral, still slightly acidic, but it can absorb. And that's where most of the absorption is taking place. So oral supplements, things taken by mouth, such as powders, capsules, soft gels, liquids, solutions, all that, have, generally speaking, a very high chance of absorbing. Right. And this is try to do it super convenient, super cost effective, for the most part, very stable things in capsules, soft gels, powders, very stable things in solution, typically not as stable. That's why I'm not a fan. If you watch our our thing on collagen, I'll explain why powder form is superior. Um, but all of this is compared to the gold standard of bioavailability as an injectable, whereas an IV is considered 100 percent, where an in intramuscular and subcutaneous are going to be slightly less, but still very high. And so that's a big, that's a big part of it. The next phase of it would be distribution. So now where is this pharmaceutically active ingredient or dietary supplement ingredient? Where is it going? Now that it's absorbed, where is it going? It's going to be distributed throughout the body. So it needs to get to its target site of action, right? And that's ultimately what we're looking for, right? And so that's a lot of times, the, a lot of the unknowns, right? Like what's happening there. And then for sure, it has to metabolize. Most of the times it'll go through the liver and it'll, it'll get ready. It'll go into, a, it'll get converted into metabolites and then it's going to be excreted. That whole process is what makes up bioavailability. Pharmaceutical companies, again, they know this pretty well. The pharmacokinetic profile, they know it very well. Dietary supplement companies have no clue. None, for the most part. What we have done at LiveGoods, we've looked at the ingredients, we've looked at the things that Big Pharma has done, and we've incorporated much of that into our formulation. That's where we're getting our intel. That's how we're coming up with our information. And so an example, right? Like, I think the diet, I think the Daily Essentials Pack is a good place to start. So like vitamin D. Vitamin D3 is choly cal cal sorry, choly calciferol. The pharmaceutical equivalent is vitamin D2. That's ergo calciferol. Well, it's been shown in multiple studies that the D3 is superior to the D2, not just based on absorption and bioavailability, but also on the blood levels that it achieves. So it's something about it that's got more effectiveness or more efficacy in, in hitting the site-specific tissues and uh, having a, a, a greater effect. So that's kind of how we're going through this process, saying what's bioavailability. Same thing going and looking at the magnesium. 
How many forms of magnesium have we heard about? There's a lot. Right. There's, there's many different Seven forms of forms. magnesium. I'm going to just give you quickly how we looked at this. Magnesium glycinate is predominantly magnesium glycinate with some magnesium gluconate. Those are highly bioavailable based on studies already performed. We know that. We don't have to do anything more, anything fancy. It is literally in this capsule, just magnesium glycinate and gluconate. There's other forms of magnesium, like magnesium oxide, poorly absorbed. It's just it's not a well-absorbed form of magnesium. There's many other forms. And you can look up the profile and see the absorption and how well each one of these esters or salt forms of magnesium perform. Being Glycinate being A, the most studied, B, one of the most highly bioavailable forms. It was a no-brainer for us. Um, to, to, to go that route. So, and then of course, in the multivitamin, um, the, B. the B vitamins. There's a couple of factors here as well. There's methylation. So methylation helps the people that have a gene variant called MTHFR. MTHFR, if they have that gene variant, they're not able to methylate properly, which is sort of, methylation is just part of a, a conversion process, a chemical conversion process. And so if you can't do that, that's why you, if you can't methylate properly, then you won't be able to access the active form of B12, folate, and of other forms um, that need methylation. So, so basically taking it would just, you would excrete. Yeah, you would mostly just eliminate it and not really derive as much benefit from it. But in this case, we put in the methylated form of B12, which, which is methylcobalamin, as well as the um, methylated form of folate. So L-methyl L-folate. And so that helps bypass the step of bioavailability, helps improve bioavailability for anybody out there that may possibly have that gene variant, which Lisa does, has that, she has that gene variant. Um, what else is in the multi? There's a, th there's a number of things. There's so many different things in the multi and things to think about as far as bioavailability. There's factors like co-administration with other things. So if somebody's on pharmaceutical drugs, like drug interactions, drugs that compete for absorption. That's why we left out calcium. We carved out the magnesium and we put that into a separate supplement. The same thing with the vitamin D. We did that and we paired the D with the K. I know I'm all over the place. I'm sorry. <laughs> the D and the K are paired because they actually complement each other pretty well. They're both fat soluble vitamins. Um, but we did carve out the D. We did carve out the magnesium. We took, we didn't want calcium in there because a lot of those can chelate. They can bind, they can compete for absorption sites. That's decreasing. The thus bioavailability. decreasing bioavailability. Now, is there any perfect science on exactly how much that would decrease? Maybe in the pharmaceutical literature somewhere, there might be some studies, but as far as dietary supplement companies providing the, the, the actual funding and research and study on it, no, I, no way. I seriously, seriously doubt it. Even if you look at the most reputable brands, Lisa, you brought this up earlier, some of those big brands that are physician grade, they try to sell to physicians only, that, you know, they tend to be on the higher end of quality, which is great. But you don't see them making claims about bioavailability. You'll never see that slapped on there as like an They really don't because they know their audience. Their audience in that case are physicians and healthcare practitioners. And they're like, look, we know that that's not entirely accurate. I mean, there's some basis to it, but it's not entirely accurate. It's kind of misleading. It's more of a marketing ploy. And that's kind of, I think, I think that's important take takeaway from all of this. So understand the couple, go ahead. You have, I feel well, like you want to say something. I was going to say in the factor four too, the uh, black pepper. Yeah. Oh, Correct. good point. Good We've point. We added the black pepper to increase, in, increase the bioavailability of curcumin. Right. Curcumin. So it can help with that increased absorption as well. All right. I know I've been scatterbrained on this topic because I think it's a big one. I love this topic. Um, right. I was going to like kind of sum it up. Um, well, let me go over a couple of other quick things. Okay. I went over a route of administration. I want to talk about the physical and chemical properties that do impact um Okay. Bioavailability. I'll help, I'll help dumb it down if it gets a little All bit right. too. Solubility is important. So how does yes. it go into solution, right? Is it fat soluble? Is it water soluble? Tends to be that fat soluble things tend to absorb better, right? There's more liberal layers. Like, so like that glutathione I showed you, water soluble. So they put it into liposomes, which means that liposomes will help get across the fat soluble membranes. Um, so solubility is a big deal, uh, and which is known. We know that. That's pretty well known. You can pretty much find that on almost almost all dietary supplement ingredients, uh, as well as pH. You want to know if it's acidic or it's basic. Um, that dictates it a little bit. The rate of dissolution, again, being in powder form and capsule, it's in powder, which means it's most stable, most stable. So it doesn't, we don't, and, and we don't really have to worry about it dissolving because we know it readily dissolves. It's, there's no real challenge to it. Um, so that's a big one. And then see, what else did I have on there? Particle size. Oh, I did want to bring that up, particle size. So we're seeing and hearing more about nanoparticles okay. and reducing particle sizes. 
um, trying to think of an example, magnesium, I think you said the other day, you were talking about some company that has a nano sized magnesium. And I get the question a lot for the collagen. collagen. But the magnesium is an interesting one because I said, to you, why would you mess with it? We know it's bioavailable. Don't mess with it. Why would we have to go through some chemical process to get it down to a nanoparticle, one billionth of a meter? Like it doesn't even matter. And at the time, the times, there's actually now warnings out there for some things that are going into the nanoparticle world. So there's some technology on the topical skin because skin is hard, right? With, with particle size and weight. Um, but nano like titanium dioxide in sunscreens. They're saying, be careful with that. The whole point of titanium dioxide in sunscreen is stay for it to top, stay on top skin, and, and act as a physical barrier mm -hmm. in the sunlight. And, and now in the case of the, the nanoparticles, really starting to seep into your tissues and absorbing, and which is kind of a problem. And you saw titanium dioxide is now banned in, in some supplements in California, in the EU, and maybe even New York here soon. Um, but yeah, so anyway, and, but it, so reducing particle size can have its pros and cons. Like in our CBD cream, we went with a nanoparticle CBD because we actually want that CBD particle, that that cream to that that molecule to get in to drive into the tissue. So it has its pros and cons. You just need to know what you're doing. Uh, and I would never want to just jump in just because someone advertises nanoparticle size. I don't think that's that's entirely always true. But particle size does matter in absorption. So it does matter. Um, it's important to, to, to know that as well. I think that covers it at least. I just want to go over those things. Uh, and then stability was my last point. And I figured we could do examples and take questions. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, in a nutshell, we could basically put the, uh, on our label. Oh, high bio 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 most bio yeah. Right. Because right. we've taken the most bioavailable ingredients or the forms of the ingredients mm -hmm. and, and, and put them in. Yeah. So again, you know, when, when I get the email that's like, well, how does this compare to this of ours? Because this one says it's got 95% bioavailability. Well, now, now you know. I mean, that label can be put on anything based on the bioavailability of the ingredients that you use. But like Ryan said, like this supplement is not going into specific testing for bioavailability, but in the ingredients that we have chosen where it's necessary, we have chosen the most bioavailable forms of the ingredients. And some of the ingredient suppliers may actually provide bioavailability studies. There, that may exist. Um, some examples of branded ingredients, like if you look at KSM 66 or ashwagandha in our super greens, that is a very large brand that you know every time you order from them, you're getting exactly what they say you're, they're providing. You have Velocitol, you have Polynol, you have Apiflex, all in these collagen peptides, all branded ingredients. So sometimes these companies will go an additional step in studies to make sure that what they're saying, and it, it all it really is, is, is it's about brand promotion. They're really trying to say, this is why our ingredient is better than a generic, just off the shelf dietary supplement ingredient. So, all right, real quick, while she's looking at some questions, stability though, I do want to bring this up because again, it has to do with bioavailability. If you have a product that does not have any shelf life, if it starts day one of the manufacturing, it has, you know, 100% call it, but then after day, you know, 10 or 20, that it's down to 75% and then the degradation process continues, we're, we're in trouble. You're not going to have much of that bioavailability to even give the body what it, it needs or what you're hoping to provide it with. So there's two real things that happen, happen in in um, degradation or in like lack of or loss of shelf life or stability is hydrolysis is the biggest and the main culprit. That's where it interacts with water. A lot of our pharmaceuticals and a lot of our ingredients and dietary supplements are like esters or paired with salts. And any introduction of water anywhere, even a high humidity environment grabs a water molecule, it, it goes through hydrolysis and it just renders it basically inactive and it starts to break down rapidly. That's why I don't like supplements in fluid or in aqueous solutions. For those reasons and for bacterial contamination so stability is a big deal i am pretty much a stickler on that so um and then the next one is oxidation so so some things will oxidize in the presence of oxygen so when you open a product you really should try to turn through it basically as fast as possible i mean because as the more it's interacting with oxygen especially if you're keeping don't, i always tell people don't keep it in the bathroom you have three things going on you have temperature light and humidity so you've got those three things cooking in there and those are the three that will really really rapidly degrade any active ingredient so just keep that in mind for bioavailability purposes 